Wow. Now, when Plato talks about how what you want for a society is that you want them to think that their laws are not only divinely from God, but that they're most ancient and they go back to the beginning of time. And when you weigh this up with what is being said in, for example, the Old Testament, and there are, there are some people who now are theorizing that the Septuagint came first and the Hebrews came, regardless if that's true or not, even if it's even if it's not true, there could be the other on the other side there could be that this Old Testament myth fits so well with what Plato envisioned that the people in Alexandria said, This is let's put this together as this Septuagint, that's Ptolemaic Empire, that is Greek, obviously, and they they have the, the libraries and they have Plato's writings. Are they putting together what becomes the the myth of the Western civilization as we know it, Judeo Christianity? That's the question, I think. Is Plato the one who constructs this? I, I, don't know, I don't know if you realize the profundity and um, uh, terror implicit in the question that you just framed. I mean, um, it is perhaps the single most disturbing question that we could grapple with about the history of Western civilization and by extension, the entire world that's been conquered and dominated by the West. And hold on, let me and, just stop for a second. Yeah. All the hours of us talking as yeah. leading up to this question right here, it literally has been, and this is, this is like the question, did Plato construct what we, what became the myth of the West, the, 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 the religion of the Western civilization, as we know it, you know, the universal church. So, okay, uh, I answer this question, not in the Pharmacon artist, although, you know, I'm, I'm developing an embryonic phase of it there. I'm planting the seeds for it there. But I answer this question of yours at the heart of Iranian Leviathan. Um, in the series of chapters that goes from the one I mentioned earlier, Emperor of Noble Lies, where I'm portraying Darius the Great as a noble liar in the style of the Platonic philosopher king, all the way through Hassan Sabah, the leader of the Order of Assassins at Alamut Fortress, claiming that nothing is true and everything is permitted, and that the entire Quran with its sonat, its Sharia law, was a noble lie. Okay, In this series of chapters, in Iranian Leviathan, I basic, which includes a treatment of the origin of the Old Testament under the influence of Mithraists who were the patrons of Jewish Pharisees that set up the second temple state after Cyrus and Darius rebuilt the temple of Solomon. Okay, I have a whole treatment of that. That chapter is comically titled Tekel, Tekel, Mene, Shekel. And it's about the relationship between the Persians and the Jews and how Judaism was created and why. And you also have so many commonalities between the Mithraic orders and the early Christians. So much. They're even, they're even using the same worship places. Right. So now, look, that would this is like a whole other conversation this, this could be yeah okay but in a nutshell in a nutshell the answer to your question is that a case can be made that people who understood very well what plato's esoteric project was and people who knew how to deploy noble lies in the most sophisticated way on the highest level or, or at the deepest level if you want to put it that way engineered the Abrahamic revelation, the, the biblical religion, as a catalyst for the transformation of society. But the catalyst was not intended to get people to become good Jews or later good Christians or even later good Muslims. The catalyst was intended to get people to go to the devil. 
The purpose of the catalyst was to confront people with an image of divinity that ought to be rejected and resisted by the conscience of the human individual. Whoa. It was a pharmacon. Remember, pharmacon. It's poison. If you don't take to it the right way, it will kill you. It's a snake bite, like the snake in the garden of Eden. Why would you tell a story like that, by the way? If your point is to get people to believe in Yahweh, why do you even have the whole narrative of the serpent offering the fruit of the tree of knowledge to Adamic man? Why? Why, why even include the story about the fallen angels and how they taught humanity to rebel against the Elohim? Why even have the Tower of Babel in there? I mean, if you just want to instill paternalistic, patriarchal, collectivistic obedience into a society, right like Confucius. Don't tell us about this serpent and about these rebel angels and about this Tower of Babel. What are you trying to do here? Instigate rebellion. Give people models of challenging authority. That's very Plato. So, wow. okay, so, so here's the thing. My view, my view is very radically divergent from the common understanding of the relationship between both Christian scholasticism and Plato and then later Islamic scholasticism and Plato because Plato was as important to the medieval Muslim thinkers as he was to the uh, Catholic sc scholastics. Conventionally, it's believed, and even Nietzsche subscribed to this idea, that Christianity is Platonism for the masses. Right. And that this Christian scholastics, uh, Aquinas, before him, Augustine, and so on and so forth, they basically adapted elements of Plato into, uh, you know, aspects of the Christian faith by making them more uh, amenable to a popular understanding, right? But what you just did is you just answered the question that scholars have been dumbfounded by, is that is the closer we get to the origins of Christianity. The closer we get to the beginning, the more diverse it is, the more Gnostics there are, the more opposing there are. There are people who literally say that Yahweh is evil and that Cain was good because he wasn't offering blood sacrifices. They start off that way. They don't, come, they don't become that way later on. They start off that way because right. they're seeing the duality within the stories. You choose right. a side. You're choosing a side. And so I, I believe it's a travesty. You're right, dude. For the Christian I'm scholastics right. to frame Plato as, quote, a virtuous pagan, unquote. Like, he would have been a Christian if he were alive today. No, no. Plato is out to create the devil. That's his aim. Plato wants to, he wants to basically promulgate diabolane, what the Greeks called diabolane, a uh, dynamic tension, a throwing through of opposites. This is what his dialectical method is about. It's why his dialogue, it's why he wrote dialogues, and it's why his writings are structured in the conversational and oppositional way that they are, because he wants people to set positions against one another. He assumes all kinds of positions through the mouth of Socrates that he himself doesn't subscribe to, and that over the, over the course of his corpus contradict each other. And he does that for the sake of provoking insight and catalyzing independent thinking. That's He's the literally separating goats from sheep in a sense where exactly. he's saying, here's That's the story. Exactly. However you interpret this will determine if you're one of these types. That's exactly it. And in fact, um, <laughs> It's genius. It really is. In fact, he comes close to saying this, you know, uh, in the seventh letter that you can't get philosophy from some treatise. That it's not like, you know, philosophy is not about subscribing to a worldview that some guy has written down in a treatise. You have to have direct experiential uh, knowledge 
of certain things about the nature of reality. And you're only going to get that in dialogue and in a life in common, he says, with others also devoted to seeking the truth. So Plato has this unwritten doctrine. And this unwritten doctrine deploys all kinds of noble lies up to and including, I believe, the theory of forms. And, and to my mind, Plato doesn't subscribe to the objective existence of these forms. They're useful constructs to promote the rise of rational thought of the kind that eventually becomes scientific analysis. Wow. Really, um, Plato, really, Plato sees the world more like Heraclitus saw it. That is amazing. I have no, I, I, I don't even know what, I think that I'm, I, I want to leave it right there because that's, that's perfect. That leaves the, 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 the viewer with something to think about. And because I think when we stuck, the way we started off with talking about the Mithraist and how their religion sort of is this religion that influences all areas of the world in all religious aspects and obviously zoroaster comes along he transform transforms this this movement and he shapes philosophy of the west and then we have this divide happening there's people looking at gods in different ways and which side do we devote ourselves to plato comes along and answers that question in an inverse way very secreted very esoteric but he does it that's it. it can't, Absolutely. That's it. And I think the takeaway is what you said, as you put it. His intention was to separate the goats from the sheep, to find a, a way to, you know, basically pass society through that filter um, and force pe to test people's metal. That's where the freaking expression comes from, right? It's the myth of the metals. That's our expression to test someone's metal comes from. The myth of the metals, ultimately, to see what someone's made of. What are you made of, right? Um, by the way, just as a nice concluding note, that's very much the question in um, Christopher Nolan's film, The Dark Knight, which I, I think is the greatest of the Batman films. Yes, today, it is. Yes, right? it is. What are you made of, right? I mean, that's what that film turns around. But that film also turns around the noble lie. The whole film's about the noble lie. Yeah. Where Batman, as the guardian of Gotham, the philosopher king, the guardian of Gotham, is forced to lie to the entire populace to take Brother. the blame for the murders committed by Harvey Dent so that Harvey Dent or Two-Face can retain his image as the white knight of Gotham. Because if people were to know that this district attorney, champion of justice and you know, uh, you know, hero fighting against corruption, that he was driven by the Joker into becoming Two-Face and committing all these murders. If people were to see Harvey Dent in that light, they would lose faith. And, you know, it would unleash anarchy and chaos in the city. And so the Joker, the trickster, forces Batman to become a noble liar in the guise of being the guardian of Gotham. But yeah, what what is that film turn around? The idea of testing someone's metal, of asking, hammering someone the way Batman is hammered by the Joker, and of asking them the question, what are you made of? Show your face, the one under the mask. Plato wore masks throughout his entire philosophical career. All of these characters in these dialogues are one or another mask of Plato, not just Socrates. But the conversation we've been having is really ultimately about the face underneath those masks that Plato wore. Wow. That is just phenomenal. And I'm sure we will think of another thing to discuss in a, in a future date. But as of now, I think this completes this four-part series in the what is behind Western esotericism. And uh, where does it come from and where, how does it end up with Plato in, on Plato's lap for him to make their choice? And it's like an IQ test. He's like giving the world an IQ test. Here you go. Here's take it or leave it. Let's, let's see where you're at. Let's see how and you interpret this. Character and a test of character of ethos, test of ethos, right? Because who, who with an ethos would ever worship Zeus or right. Yahweh? Yeah. 
Like, you don't have here. to be a genius, right? I mean, in Plato's ideal state in the Republic, you have the philosopher, because... but then the warrior caste, the warrior caste, they're in the positions they, they are because they're virtuous, they're noble. It's why they're entrusted with the weaponry to protect society. They're not geniuses, the people in the warrior caste, but they do have ethos. Ethos defines them. And so those people are not, uh, you know, individuals who would worship a Zeus or a Yahweh. Right. Yeah, and that and, and it so geniusly gives them something to to go to battle for, yeah. you know. So it all it, it helps it helps out, and that's it's so layered. It has so many different dimensions of playing the uh, what do you call it? The puppet with the strings. Like he's got yeah. so many puppets on different strings, all by one person on top. But if they're all they're all doing different things, different purposes. It's really you know, mind -blowing. As, a last, as a really as a last point, Neil. Uh, let me just say that people should think of my philosophical project in these terms, okay? I learned from Plato. I mean, people, a lot of people have framed me as a Nietzschean or something or a Heideggerian. Or, first of all, I don't belong to any of these schools of philosophy. I have my own philosophical project. But when I say I learned from Plato, I mean, I really learned from Plato. <laughs> my work is in the style of Plato. My project is very much an esoteric project in the sense of Plato's esoteric and unwritten doctrine.